Okay, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, today it's only a very simple topic of object detection. Uh, I'm going to be discussing this paper on end-to-end -end object detection with transformers. So when you see this, two things should come out. One is end-to-end -end and one is transformers. So I guess this is like one of the fundamental papers now. Came two years back and it came in ECCV 2020 and it has 19,040 citations as of today morning last I checked. Uh, this is sort of the output it spits out. So this is my workspace and uh, this is the bounding box around every person so it's detecting me as a person one is like its maximum confidence. LED1 manages to get that small photo. Although its confidence drops from 1 to 0.89, but it detects a person there. And then you can see it finds some keyboards, mouse, a laptop here, and it also detects this keyboard. So the orientation of keyboard doesn't really bat it. So it seems like a pretty reasonable model. So that's what we are going to be studying today. So this paper, had only two tasks which it was doing. So um, the first one is detection. So what happens in detection is that you're given an image. Your your aim is to basically cut out it to basically detect the boundary around the elephant here. So this has two elephants. That's why we are trying to get two bounding boxes around the elephants and. This 100% is like the confidence score that how confident are we that we managed to detect out this elephant and similarly you can see that zebra and baby zebra in the other thing and the authors are also using this for something called panoptic segmentation which is like you are given a scene and you have to segment out the various uh, various things in this so here, this is like different colors denote different color of the objects present. So you just pass this image or RGB image to the network and what you're getting is a colored map like this. So it is now, so you can see that, okay, it is segmenting out the oven and the rest of the entire thing is like the counter and then this is the sink. So basically it uh, tries to label each pixel as belonging to certain categories. So that's what the paper is doing. I'm gonna talk about detection, not about panoptic segmentation because that's just something trivial, so won't really teach you anything. But this is object detection, right? Doesn't seem too good. So uh, this idea has been expanded to videos. So this is a paper which was extending the same idea of the paper I am going to present in videos to, to videos from, from the images. It was published in CVPR last year, has around 197 citations as of this morning and these are its outputs. So you can see that we have a video and we are able to segment out the rat and we are able to do that in real time. So. This is what our lab has done. So on the top, you see a ground truth of the person. And this like this is the ground truth. This is the action a person is climbing the rope. So we just trained some variant of those models. And these are our outputs. Uh, so yeah. So it seems that the performance on action detection for such models is pretty nice. I won't say good enough right now. But it's something which seems like which seems something worth exploring. So I just thought to show some results before I talk. So my purpose today is to bore you. <laughs> and the second thing is I'm gonna talk about this paper. So the paper is already amazing, right? I don't want to waste your time in showing you numbers, graphs, or things you can already see in papers and read. So I don't want to show you something you can already read. I don't want to cut the paper snapshots out and put it on the slides and just show those things. Uh, so rather what I want to show is spend some time on core ideas because 
sometimes reading papers things don't become clear to us how they are operating so i just focus on the core ideas and then i will comment briefly about uh, I, a small demo of how i took that photograph of myself being detected from the model so it's just around 100 lines of code and then i end with some problems in the detection like what problems we all have and by end i just think that you have more questions than we have answers so like right now you are starting thinking okay you will know something by the end you will have far more questions and even i can't answer those in fact no one can and i guess that's the way that's that's the aim of our discussions but what we should know is like what are the problems which are worth solving in the field of object detection and why we need more ideas in the field and like why do we need more creative minds which can come from younger chaps because i guess once a person gets old then he becomes saturated right he can't think more creatively so this paper was by my friend nicolas at facebook he is a pretty young chap so that's one of the good things so object detection can be thought of as building on some easier tasks so i'll just show like what those tasks are so the first task is that of classification so imagine that i give you this photograph so you know what this photograph is right this is mona lisa if i ask you what this photograph is so how will you do that task so you will take this mona lisa and you will pass it to a classification network and it will tell you that okay it's a mona lisa right so we already have this classification network with us any sort of resonant diagram or icd diagram can work here and it spits out a number right that number tells us how confident it is that this thing is a mona lisa and it tells us that this is a mona lisa it could have been me in that figure so that mona lisa can be some class of the image so then what we are trying to do is object detection we are trying to make bounding boxes around those elephants right what i showed you before was just taking something and spitting whether that's a mona lisa or not so how do we actually do detection because in in detection the aim is to predict a bounding box around the object so one of the normal ways can be to treat classification as a detection so for example if i ask you in this figure where is mona lisa's nose so what will you do you will uh, cut mona lisa out so you will have these small regions like this eye this left eye right eye both this nose and something like this right so you will cut this bigger picture into smaller pictures and then you will pass each of the pictures through a classification model right what you will get as output is maybe four numbers right so for the first number it will say okay it's not the nose so it will say that my confidence is low 0.1 for second also it's a bit high but it's not that high but for the third one it says that it's a 0.99 and for the fourth one it says that it's a 0.3 so i say that okay i got four outputs out so the one which is highest maybe represents the nose right and since i cropped this region out i already know how i cropped it so i could put a bounding box around the nose so the important point is that i first make the crops pass it through the classifier use the confidence and apply a thresholding and then i know okay if anything is coming out to be greater than 0.99 or maybe 0.8 then i know that that image is corresponding to a possible location of the nose right then i plot i plot the bounding box around that nose but the what this would require you to do is to cut mona lisa into many pieces right i just put four crops here in any way i could make cut the crop the image into right if you were to actually find the exact region of the image so you can imagine that this image could be cut in any particular shape right in fact it like a lot of rectangles if i have so many rectangles these are just four if i have so many rectangles and if i cut out so many of them then and pass each of them through the classifier and do this it's going to take me a lot of time so it shows us that okay a classifier could be used as a sort of detector 
where this core can be used to find a rough bounding box but if we want a absolutely tight like if the bounding box is loose or if it's pretty tight so to find a tight bounding box it might not do that good job but it still helps us to think about classification as being a precursor towards detection so yeah so then we are sad right that there are so many pieces of the image that we have to cut so what can we do so yeah so the third thing is called a proposal yeah that's that's just a, it's actually a proposal but it's not a sort of conjugal thing so what you do is you take mona so mona lisa okay yeah so uh, you take mona lisa and you generate interesting regions in mona lisa so like rather than trying to cut her into random rectangles or things like that just any uh, random algorithm you do some magic and that magic looks at uh, some regions which might be something like nose i won't comment on what that algorithm is yet just imagine that it's a block which does something and what it does is that once it gives you the output instead of cutting it it gives you now three things earlier i had drawn four things right it now gives you three things the important function of this block is that you no longer need to do a lot of cutting of the image it automatically figures out that what regions are the regions which are something which we need to look at so we don't really need to cut it into a lot of rectangles so now we have this with us and these are lesser than the earlier four rectangles which i proposed earlier which i showed earlier we we pass this through a classifier get the three scores we found 0.99 and we are good to go right so the important point here is the things which which is doing the job is this guy which is the proposal thing which still needs us to understand how it operates which i won't define in this talk i'm just mentioning it that it seems like a something which needs to be figured out right and people have been figuring this out since the past 3 or 4 years uh does a pretty good job but it makes our life very difficult because first generate the, this region that get these images and classify them and then so this is not a end to end system right this is just first this step and then this step and something like that so you can't really train it end to end so another question for you is suppose i give you mona's lisa image and i ask you to detect mona's eyes and mona's lips so what you will do here is that so the task is you might draw a bounding box like this and a bounding box like this if you were a human right so and how will we do this in a model we chop mona lisa out again using those previous step of generating those proposals we classify those and we generate two dictionaries right one dictionary is like nose confidence one is lip confidence so like for this image what does the network think how much nose it has it has a 0.3 of nose and lip it doesn't have that much but for here it has a lot of nose in it not much of lip right so if you see in this a single row for each image it can either say that it has a nose or a lip so we are basically predicting these two things now and this number is more so it knows that this image has a nose and it knows that this number has a this thing has a lip so what we have done now the additional thing earlier i was only predicting this right now i have a additional dictionary and i'm just taking the bigger scores from this so yeah so it seems that okay we can detect multiple bounding boxes inside the same object so here the object is mona lisa we could use the same classifier to detect both eyes and lips together by just predicting these two dictionaries together okay because this is just a matrix multiplication just increase the dimensions of the output you are good right so uh, this can be done end to end so it means that okay classifier can do a good job for predicting multiple boxes just by increasing the output dimensions but still the bottleneck is that proposal thing right so am i making sense or yeah okay. Oh, okay okay so what we can do is hope to god that input crops are proper noses and eyes right we are assuming that 
that Aloy proposal is a good guy and we hope that this crop is good. It might be possible it's not good, right? We are from, like we can take rectangles in so many ways. It might be that this is not good. You can imagine there are a lot of chances of that. We just hope to God that inputs are proper bounding boxes around noses and eyes. Number of inputs is number of forward passes. So if we have three such images, we have to make three forward passes to the network, right? So if you are having this Mona Lisa, you cut her up into three pieces. With the same classifier, you have to make three forward passes, right? You can't make this prediction in a single forward pass. You could argue that, okay, I can bash these together along the bash dimension and just forward pass, but that hits a limit. You can't fit that much on a GPU. So this is what RCNN and fast RCNN and all other things like that have done. And I guess they have been struggling with this idea of generating the proposals till now. So now let me show you an alternate way which we could think about the detection problem. Imagine that on the right I take Mona Lisa and I cut her up. So what I have done is I have seen the window from top left. So first here, then here, then here. And what you can see is that sequence unrolled. So I am starting from here, it's her forehead, then left eye, then her nose, then right eye and all those nose regions. And what I am saying is that instead of doing any sort of proposal, let me just assign some numbers to these images. So you can see, you can see that all these image numbers sum up to 1, right? So now in this, what I am trying to do is, basically I am trying to assign a higher, I am trying to search for Mona Lisa's eyes and I am trying to assign a higher weight to the image patch which contains Mona Lisa's eyes. So here point 0.2 is greater than point 0.1. So these two things are greater than the other things and which is pretty good to go, right? I am not still explaining how it works, I am just trying to understand like if I can do it then I am good to go. So, um, if I were to do this for Mona's eyes, this is what it would look like. If I were to do this for Mona Lisa's lips, it would look something like this, right? The same sequence, so these two sequences are entirely same, only the distribution of these numbers gets changed, right? It's a point 0.4 here. The reason it's point 0.4 is because here there are two eyes, so we are a bit confused what is the eye, but here there is only one lip, right? So we are pretty confident that is only one of the image. So it makes sense it should be twice as likely as the height. Uh, yeah. So what this shows us is that if we cut an image into pieces, if we are searching for a body part, then we can find the weight of some of the images which are pretty much bigger than the other things. And we can then just localize this, maybe localize it in some way. So. So now a computer does this, it says that I am God, I see everything. Why is it a God? Because it can cut this entire thing and see it together, everything together in, in, a, in the memory, right? What it say, and also it says that I assign weights to interesting regions. So here it assigns more weight to eye and more weight to the lips. And, um, it says that my eyes are everywhere. A computer can look everywhere. So right now, the computer is searching for Mona Lisa's eyes also, and it's also searching for Mona Lisa's lips. It's learning two set of weights. One is this weights and one is this weights. One weight is only focusing for searching for eyes, and other set of weights is searching for lips. So you can imagine if I give you a crowded scene, if I take an image, if I unroll into a sequence, the sequence will look same. What I am just searching is a different set of weights for each set of objects in the image. So it could be a chair here, it could be me here, it could be Miss Ander here or Pedro, right? Or Ethan. Sorry, I forgot the name of the fourth guy. Okay. So here, Mona Lisa's eyes. I just copied over the last slide, so some observations. So here there are two eyes, right? So point 0.2 numbers are greater than all the point 0.1s here, right? Okay. Left eye is equal to right eye, right? So left, so this network doesn't really distinguish between 
the left eye or the right eye. If I were to reconstruct this image together, I could know that this eye was on the left and this eye was on the right. Right? But if I just see this sequence, this image seems same to me. So I don't know whether this is left eye or right eye. That's why I am assigning them equal weights, which seems to be a blunder, right? I don't know whether it's left eye or right eye. I just know both are eyes. I am assigning them a weight of 0.2. So you can't distinguish between the left eye and right eye through this method. So individual eyes remain same if viewed in isolation. If you look at this image or this image, you can't distinguish between it. If you put this back together as an RGB matrix, then maybe you could, by seeing the location of the eye with respect to nose, you would say, okay, this is the nose, this eye is to the left of nose, this eye is to the right, uh, right of nose, so maybe it's a right eye. But by just looking at the nose in isolation, you can't look at the eye. So the problem is, if I couldn't look at the individual eyes and know whether it's a left eye or right eye, what could I do? The issue is I could solve that problem by looking at its relation with the nose, right? So what's the next idea? The next idea is you try to assign positions. So this is what a position is like. That, okay, I assign position 5 to the nose. So I know that 4 is to the left of 5. So maybe this is the left eye. And I know 6 is to the right of this, so maybe this is the right eye. Right? So, you would say that left eye is in position 4, right eye is in position 6. But my question is, will this work? If I do this sort of modeling into the network, I give it the positions also through some mechanism. Here I am just putting simple integers. Will it be able to distinguish between left or right eye property? What do you think? Well, if you put it, if you put the image in upside down, then it wouldn't work. Yeah. So this is Mona Lisa. I just flipped her. Okay. So this is some offset because when I change her, then this region is more than this. So I had to shift it. You can see both the eyes lining up, right? So now that right eye is to the left. But if I do a raster scan over this image, I will end up with identical sequences. Right? The first one and the second one will still be the same sequences. Here this was a left eye, but since I flipped it, it would be a right eye here. Even if whatever whatever thing I do, like whatever, uh, whatever numbers I give here, the eye will still be at second position, this eye will still be at fourth position. Both images are same and I still don't, and nose is still in the between. I still don't know whether this is left eye or right eye, right? And this is why most of the people are doing foolish ways. They are training transformers with horizontal augmentations and trying to find objects, which does well, but that's why this doesn't make sense. So for a machine, both images are same, right? It can't distinguish. I guess this property is good because if you want the machine not to make mistake in augmentation, but I guess in nature, there are certain things. So I just explained three things. That you can cut an image into these parts and assign these weights. And you pick higher weights which are like eyes and you try to... And which is good for eye detection, right? Because both eyes, although you can't distinguish, you can distinguish two eyes with other body parts. So point 0.2 is greater than point 0.1, that similarity is fine. But as soon as you are trying to distinguish between left and right, that doesn't work. So the body parts which look same, you can't distinguish between them using a method like this. And then we tried to compensate for it by introducing these orderings which didn't work. And then ordering helps if parts are identical, but it doesn't help like if I just flip, flip the image. I, this is flipped, right? Yeah. This is flipped. Yeah. When you say down, down is a good job actually. Yeah. This is fine. So now, Flipping still yields parts in the same position. So like you see right that uh, this eye is over here and after flipping it's still in fourth position. So that's the issue. So what my intuition is now, like how am I building towards that paper, like the, the transformer based paper. So I take Mona Lisa, I chop her into pieces. I get some pieces like this, okay. Then I assign weights to each of Mona Lisa's pieces. 
something like this which you saw on the last slide okay just assign the weights randomly to her we don't know what the correct weights are yet but we chop her and we just assign the weights to mona lisa species we look at regions of higher weights so here you say okay network doesn't know yet anything it is learning some weights it's assigning to these regions right now it thinks that these two are the eyes so i'm just picking these two regions and then what i'm doing is i need a rectangle around mona lisa right i am just trying to predict a rectangle outside okay so do you see what's the difference now i no longer need those proposals anymore i am directly predicting a rectangle out and i am just learning these weights so it's better than trying to chop her into a lot of pieces i will just chop her into four pieces i don't know what piece is what it might be possible it contains i in only this region but i would need a proper bounding box so it's fine if the eye doesn't cover the entire image but if i know i know it's okay it's somewhere in this region so then right now my bounding box is this but when i'm trying to paint a rectangle my bounding box will get reduced to this so this regression of bounding box can be done in the last step what we were doing in the proposals is we were assuming the proposals to be fine for classification which was a big blunder yeah so now this is the model let's not forget about let me just show what i have shown where it fits into the picture you will feed mona lisa here you will chop her into pieces here you will assign the weights to each of the pieces in this region and this will give you the rectangle out okay so you take a mona cut her up that thing is done by some sort of shit i'll tell that later so you get these pieces for each of these pieces you try to find some set of weights how much each piece is in the eye and you will try to predict the eye through this box so uh so this is how this fits into the bigger picture so yeah so i thought this concept is important to say because people just start with a transformer but they don't understand why do we need to do it and the rest of my talk is hopefully going to be about how to get individual components of this working again not much technical detail but an intuitive detail because i guess one hour is not enough for a lot of mathematics so so right now the biggest problem for me is what i need to describe is how to assign these weights right chopping is fine anyone can chop it how do i assign these weights how do i learn them that seems to be the biggest issue so and this chopping weights i told it was being done here so specifically i'm talking about how this component is working but i won't talk about how it is working i will make a side track and give you a small example okay so suppose someone comes to you and says okay pedro do you want to play hockey yes so so now the way the pedro's brain will function is it will say that i have hands so i guess i could hold a hockey stick right because pedro has hands his mind will think okay i have hands i can hold a hockey stick right and then pedro will say that okay i already use my hands to hold a bat and i'm pretty good at cricket right so i guess a hockey stick i could hold with a hand i and it, it it shouldn't be much challenging because it's similar like a bat right just a differently shaped bat so pedro combines the ideas of these two things in his mind right he says okay i can hold the stick i can play i play cricket so i guess hockey must not be too difficult for me so what he does is uh, he uses what is like inside his mind there are two concepts like he can use his hands and he already knows how to play cricket he is able to mix these two concepts and then he says okay based on these two concepts maybe i could play hockey and then he tries to go and play hockey so he goes and this is what actually happens okay so now you might ask that what why is this important 
So now I want you to focus on some technical part of this. Okay. So first, somebody came to me and asked me, "Do I want to play a hockey?" So he asked me something, right? That is a query. He asked me something. I don't know the answer to that yet. So that's what is known as a query. Then I used two ideas in my brain, which were like that hands can be used to hold hockey stick, and hockey is similar to cricket. So my brain already had some ideas, and I'm trying to understand whether those two ideas line up with playing hockey or not, right? So brain can have a lot of such ideas. So what I did, my brain did something magical inside it. It it automatically assigned the ideas to it automatically assigned weights to some of my like well if my hands are being used it asks that okay point five for my hands and I guess it's gonna be similar like cricket so point four like my hands right because maybe you could use a hockey in a ice bowl in a ice rink that then it won't be like a cricket but still you would be using your hands so your hands might be more relevant to playing hockey right. So you might end up assigning higher weights, 0.5 to hockey, but it's still similar to cricket, which is a 0.4. So, um, so his brain had two ideas of uh, playing hockey using hands and playing it similar to cricket, and he somewhat, somewhat magically assigned some weights, and then he you combined these weights and made a decision to play hockey, right? He used these weights, did some magic, and used his decision whether he wants to play hockey or not. And maybe what he did is he outputted a single number between zero and one, denoting his confidence, right? So, so I guess it seems like a reasonable way to model how the brain functions, right? But um, like what's remaining is understanding how these weights come from. But we all know that brain has some of these ideas, right? A neural network doesn't have brain; it doesn't know these concepts. So I'll talk about how it could learn those concepts in a top-down manner. So, so brain contains a lot of memories. If someone comes to Pedro and asks him, "Do you want to play hockey with me?" There is a lot of things going on in Pedro's brain, right? Pedro can also play basketball. He can kick, play football. He can use his hands, and then. There is a so there are a lot of concepts in Pedro's brain. So how do we know which one is relevant to playing hockey, right? Because if he is combining two ideas, these two ideas, how do we know that these two ideas could be chosen out of these four? And I guess Pedro's brain is more advanced than that, right, Pedro? You yeah. you have a lot of thoughts other than these four. So how do we know that only these two ideas were being chosen and mixed together? So. Um, yeah so what we did is that someone came and asked pedro's brain do you want to play hockey right so he assigned numbers to all of these all of the thoughts right he picked some top of these and he measures the relevance of hockey to each of the memories in the brain so he know okay will i use feet in hockey Maybe not that much. Yeah, you obviously need feet, but not that much. I put some larger number. Yeah, it was my mistake. But just understand the gist. So he says, okay, definitely I won't use a basketball, so I will assign a lesser weight, and I will assign more weights to other ideas. Okay. So he compute. The important thing is for each of the input queries, he is computing its relevance with all of the ideas, and he is getting some number, right? That number is giving him a measure of how close maybe hands are to playing hockey. So he picks the one which is more meaningful. So in this case, it's hands and playing cricket, and he assigns higher weights to those memories. So 0.5 and 0.4 are like higher weights. So that seems to work. So now what we ended up with having a brain, a lot of memories. For each memory, computing the relation with a particular query, assigning the weights. So at least we are in a better position than where we started with. We have somewhat of a mathematical model. So now let me give you a dictionary analogy. So you all are computer science majors, right? The way a dictionary functions is like this. It has a key, right? Rajat and audience, and it has some values, right? So you pick some keys. You get some value out. So we say it's a O1 operation. 
because it's essentially stored as a hash table in the memory, which is a foolish way, but I'll talk about that later on after behind the scenes. Um, so we do something similar with the brain. So what I want you to understand is that the brain functions as a dictionary inside itself. And that dictionary is different from the way the dictionary operates in a Python programming. Uh, but still, we first need to understand how brain functions as a dictionary. So what we do is, we have an input query like a hockey. We have all these body parts and we are assigning some of these weights to them. So inside the brain, what are the keys? The keys are these legs, hands, basketball, cricket, something like that, right? And what are the values? I don't know what the values are, right? Brain might be doing any sort of mathematics inside it, I don't know. But if I don't know it, that's fine, I'll feed it to the model, stir it until the pile starts to become good. But the important point is brain has some ideas, it has some values in it, and for each of these keys, I could do a particular magic. So basically, if the brain knows where, what, what does the hand mean, so it can look hand and get the value of the hand out, right? So brain essentially functions like a like a concept of, as a key, but the key is here at a higher level than here. Here these are just blind strings, right? But here these are some higher concepts like legs, hands, something which we understand but we can't describe in numbers, right? Something we can't describe in terms of simple string. So what the brain will do is, it will take the hockey and it will compute its relation with all of the keys inside the brain. So it will know how near hockey is to the leg, hand, basketball and cricket and it will calculate the bigger numbers, right? And that way it should be able to measure, it should be able to spit out an output. So what's a reasonable way to spit out the output? So 0.5, okay, hand is here, what's the value of hand? Something, right? It's only 0.5 relevant to the query. It's only 0.5, like it was more relevant to the query. So I guess I measured hockey's relevance to hand. Is hand going to be used in hockey? Yes, I'm 0.5% confident about it. So let me just multiply 0.5 with whatever the representation of hockey is inside my brain. And then I will add similarly for cricket 0.4 times something and I will drop the other two. They are not very much relevant, right? But how, how is it that you get the numbers for how like the 0.5 and the 0.4, yeah, how is it that you know what the relation is? We don't. Is. We don't. We don't know what the numbers are. We don't know what the keys are. We don't know what the values are. But we know that a query has to have some sort of similarity with a key. And that has to help in the retrieval of memory from the brain, which has to be added together so that we could output a single number, which is like whether I want to play hockey or not. We have two ideas. I can use hand, I can use cricket. But I need to get a concrete number out whether I want to play hockey or not. So I need to be able to combine multiple memories together. The best way to combine them is a simple addition. That's how logistic regression worked. That's how linear regression worked. So I guess that's how this should work. I'm not sure. I am not saying I know the weights, but we would know the weights via backdrop. So <clears throat> there is one problem in whatever I said. It required me to know the definitions of memories. It required me to understand, it required the brain to understand what leg, hand, basketball and cricket are, right? That's why I was able to pick these two weights and forget these two weights. And that's why this term has only two terms. It doesn't have four terms to it because I rejected these two. But why did I reject these two? Because I know that leg and basketball are not relevant to query. But why, why, why was that important? Because I knew what leg means, right? But if I take a child, if I take an infant, he's newly born, I just ask him, do you want to play hockey? He'll say yes. <laughs> like, he doesn't know what basketball is. He has never seen it. That's what the network is. He doesn't know these keys. He doesn't know this. It, it definitely doesn't know this. It doesn't know this, right? So it seems that I have done this mathematics. I'm ending up with a model. But this is feeling like shit, right? I could reject this, but a machine couldn't because it doesn't know what leg or basketball is yet. Maybe it could become that much intelligent. So a child does not know what leg, hand, basketballs, cricket are. And these definitions were important because they allowed you to measure the correlation of the key with the hockey. 
and a neural network is worse than a child at least at this level so this was the situation earlier right this was the picture on the last slide you did um, something something keys you assume are the concepts a human knows and you just take these two rejected two others added them but this is what we actually do we don't know what keys are we don't know what keys are so what we do is we measure the relevance of key of the query of key to all of the keys so to all of the body parts leg hand basketball cricket we don't know what leg is we just measure the relevance which is some integer okay so we just measure we end up with these weird numbers what we do is we just multiply these numbers by these values so you may do you see what's the good thing now earlier i had two terms now i have four terms right it's just taking the values adding it for all the things here i was rejecting two because i know the concepts here i don't know all the concepts i'm just putting lower weights to them so it doesn't matter even if you don't know the concept if you have a lower weight so it's just adding these numbers and it spits out a particular output in the out right which seems not like a reasonable thing to me but to others it seems so i guess i'll have to go with the bigger norm and not by show my own wrong opinions right now so <clears throat> in in real world you don't know what the correct query is if i tell if i give you an image and i ask you locate all the objects in this do you don't know what i should ask a neural network find a object right i could say it, find a object but i don't know how to frame that for a machine which is sitting inside a computer right to a human i could say hey pedro find object but if he is a russian guy and i ask him find object he won't understand it right a computer can't understand is do you want to play hockey although if he were a human he might so a computer doesn't know the query also right it doesn't know the keys it it doesn't have any concepts like legs hand basketball or cricket it doesn't know any values right it doesn't know anything but one thing which operates is if it knew a query then i could compute its relation with the key add the values together and train it right and hope over the time it learns some keys it learns some queries learn some values right so that's the way you just take query random keys random values random just push them through that formula and just do a back prop through some loss we find the system relaxing to a stable representation so and i guess that's the big idea which they did i guess we covered this so here in this first concept neural network is like a child it doesn't know anything it's looking at the chalk pieces of mona lisa it doesn't know what mona lisa's eyes are right it doesn't know what the query is what key is what value is it it learns all of those right now once it has learned something it has the concepts in its brain what does a eye look like what does a value look like like what does eye look like what does a hand look like right so this process is used in decode and coder when all the things are to be learned you don't have the bigger concepts with you so you are learning all the concepts here query keys and values right but once you know what a i is what's the number corresponding to the i your brain already has a bigger concept in it like it already has um, the keys and value pairs right so all that remains is to understand where the object is so i already know how does a human look like i already know how does a i look like and now i want to know inside an image how to get the humans out right so i'm trying to understand the queries but i already know the keys keys and values so in this in, in the decoder part the queries are being learned but keys and values are used from the encoder so similarly to how we did in dictionary we had keys and values fixed and we were trying to match them with the queries but we don't know the queries anymore so they were feeding in these queries and they were learning them but in this decoder they are not learning keys or values 
okay they are being fed from the encoder because they assume that the encoder has already learned a dictionary of the representation so this is what the figure look like they had an image they just they just feed in two random random noises and what they get as output are two 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 local like the two boxes around the ducks no proposals nothing just feed in this random noise which acts like a query and then just get the things out you don't need anything anymore no proposal no classifier no tubes nothing like that okay let me show this to you before we wrap uh okay yep it's just going to take a minute to run so this idea takes at most a minute to run on a cpu less than a minute if i'm not wrong so it's pretty quick okay till then you can see right so this is the convolutional layer this is the the thing i chopped um, so this is what my architecture had looked like right you had a cnn you had an encoder you had a decoder and you were predicting the bounding boxes out you were taking mona lisa chopping her into pieces feeding them to encoder pushing this back and just feeding random noise from here right so the first part the cnn part is written somewhere here uh yeah so you can see like all the convolutional layers which are applied here so this is a normal cnn and then they are just feeding the they are just feeding the normal uh noise here they are passing it through the transformer and and the curious, the the main thing of this paper is this query embedding so this random shit they are just sending as input to the network so this is just random they are just initializing it as some parameter which is a random and they are just training it and it works and why it works i have tried to explain that but yeah by the time you run this uh it ends up with a photo of mine so uh yeah uh yeah so that's one of the things and now let me show you some curious things remember that video which i gave you the video the video of the mouse yes so this was that skater so what they did is they have an image this person is skating in the grand theft auto and they have this person present here the skate present here so they can uh, segment out the person separately and the skate so there will be one video of the skate automatically traveling in a green and the person traveling separately so they can track multiple people in the video together they were doing it some with the same architecture just a blind decoder so these greens correspond to the person so if it's a video the this is person one frame one person one frame two person one frame three a person in different frames so for of each of these greens they are just getting the detections of the person out similarly for the skate all the blues are skate okay so you understand right if i if there are four people moving in the scene then it will um it will segment out the mass of all the four people in form of a video together in parallel no proposal nothing there is nothing parallelism there is no batching occurring here this is all at the same time input so the one thing which you would expect from this detector is this image has two people right persons and skates here it, it can track four things so instance one instance it, it can track four things right now because of its dimensionality so what i would expect it it should track two it should track the person it should track the skate and the other two should be just drive background right it shouldn't track other people right so if i mask everything except green so i let them train this model i trained their model i didn't do anything if i mask all the if i take all the greens and i mask all the others out 
assuming I set all of these two zeros, what does this mean? This means I am asking the model, hey model, can you just switch these on which correspond to the person and can you only give me the output of the person? Like if you were really doing this, can you give me the output of this person? If I mask all these things out, right? This is a reasonable thing to expect. Because if it's saying that, okay, I'm segmenting out person, let me cut off all the other things. If they are state, then it doesn't have anything to do with the person. I, I mask everything, right? So, what I expect is that it should track one person if the greens are on, and if all others are off, it shouldn't track anything else, right? This is what happens. You saw what happened? I blew the shit out of it. It started with the green, then it lost the track, right? So things are not as good as they seem. It lost lost its tracking ability over the time. Yup. So I guess we are at the end. So what I'm trying to say is that field is moving away from the anchors and proposals. All the architectures like YOLO and RCNN, fast RCNN, all of those are going to be pretty obsolete soon. Object-centric representations can be learned. You remember that photo I showed you of two ducks coming out in parallel. So the network can focus on an object. We don't need any complex things like anchors. You can just feed normal RGB frames and get the network to learn the anchors. Transformers are good. Sorry. What happened? What, my computer ended or what? Okay, transformers are good, but position and codings are shit, right? You remember the, that flipping case I showed you? So position and encoding works, but it doesn't really work. The other thing is Hungarian losses. I didn't cover this, but we can discuss that after the talk. If any of you guys are interested. Attention is global in nature. The issue is this. You can't multitask. If I ask you to work on something, you will work on it with more quality. If I give you a lot of work, you will you won't be able to do it fine, right? A similar problem occurs in Transformer. If it is looking at everything, it is assigning a weight to everything, right? The sum of the weights should be one. So it can't assign a higher weight to an individual thing. Because if it's assigning a higher weight to an individual object, then it has to lower the other weights. But it might be possible that some other things are there which are more important, which need to be more high. So, uh, that can't be fixed by applying a normal uh, sigmoid instead of soft math. I tried that. Uh, yeah, so that's why people are doing foolish things these days. They have come with called transformers, mixing convolutions with transformers, so that you can learn local context like a convolutional layer does and a bigger context like a transformer layer does, which makes the field silly. We don't know what the correct thing is. The, the answer is not to feed, like what we just do is feed random shit in the networks, converge them to backdrop, but yeah, those things don't make concepts. So yeah, I guess that's all. So thank you so much. And that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.